Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to call this meeting of the Council to order and thank you for joining us today. Let me note that um, for my colleagues that are joining us virtually today, um, they are Acting Chairman Grunberg and Independent Member, Member Workman. We have four agenda items today. First, we'll hear a presentation and hold a vote on the Council's Digital Assets Report. Next, we'll vote on establishing the Council's Climate-Related Financial Risk Advisory Committee and we'll approve its initial slate of members. Then we'll hear a presentation on the upcoming Treasury Report on Cloud Services Adoption in the financial sector. And finally, we'll vote on the minutes of the Council's previous meeting. Our first agenda item is a discussion and vote on issuing the Council's report on digital asset financial stability risks and regulation. So I'm going to turn it over to Sandra Lee from Treasury and Jonathan Rose, senior economist from the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, who's on detail to the FSOC staff at Treasury for the presentation. Thank you, Secretary Yellen. Um, we are very pleased to present this report on digital assets to the Council. Staff from all the Council member agencies have worked uh, closely together to evaluate digital asset activities with a focus on identifying potential risks to financial stability, evaluating the existing regulatory structure, and developing recommendations to address these risks. The outcome of these efforts is the report that the Council will vote on today. This report presents the views of the full range of federal and state regulators who sit on the Council, and it highlights key risks that policymakers should aim to address. I will turn to Jonathan Rose for an overview of the report's findings. Thanks, Jonathan. Thank you. As Sandra noted, the Council's digital asset report addresses financial stability risks, regulatory gaps, and recommendations for action. I will take each of these topics in turn. Beginning with financial stability risks, the report concludes that crypto asset activities could pose risks to the U.S. financial stability under certain conditions. Those conditions are, first, if their interconnections with the traditional financial system or their overall scale were to grow, and second, if that growth were to occur without adherence to or being paired with appropriate regulation, including the of enforcement of the existing regulatory structure. The report highlights stablecoin activities as a notable source of potential interconnections with the traditional financial system. At the same time, inside the crypto asset ecosystem, the report details sources of acute instability arising from speculation-driven crypto asset prices, interconnections within the crypto asset ecosystem, operational vulnerabilities, funding mismatches and run risk, and leverage. Turning to regulation, the report places particular emphasis on compliance with and enforcement of the existing regulatory structure as a key step in addressing financial stability risks. The report also notes that many non-bank firms in the crypto asset ecosystem have advertised themselves as regulated. For example, many firms emphasize their registration as money services businesses, though such regulation does not provide a comprehensive framework for mitigating financial stability vulnerabilities. While some firms in the crypto asset ecosystem have attempted to avoid regulation, other firms have engaged with the existing re regulatory system by obtaining trust charters or special state-level crypto assets specific charters or licenses. Although the existing regulatory system covers large parts of the crypto asset ecosystem, this report identifies three gaps in the regulation of crypto asset activities in the United States. First, the spot market for crypto assets that are not securities are subject to limited direct federal regulation. As a result, those markets may not be subject to a regulatory framework designed to ensure orderly and transparent trading, prevent conflicts of interest and market manipulation, and protect investors in the financial system more broadly. The report recommends the passage of legislation providing rulemaking authority for federal financial regulators over this market. Second, crypto asset market businesses do not have a consistent or comprehensive regulatory framework and can engage in regulatory arbitrage. Some crypto asset businesses may have affiliates or subsidiaries operating under different regulatory frameworks, with no single regulator having visibility into risks across the entire business. To address the risk of regulatory arbitrage, the report recommends continued coordination legislation addressing the risks posed by stablecoins, legislation relating to regula regulators' authorities to have visibility into and supervise the activities of all of the affiliates and subsidiaries of crypto asset entities, and appropriate service provider regulation. 
Third, a number of crypto asset trading platforms have proposed offering retail customers direct access to markets by vertically integrating the services provided by intermediaries such as broker dealers or futures commission merchants. Financial stability and investor protection risks may arise from retail investors' exposure to some practices often proposed by vertically integrated trading platforms, such as automatically and rapidly closing out customer positions. The report therefore recommends study of potential vertical integration by crypto asset firms. With that, we'll be happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. And on behalf of the entire council, I'd like to express my thanks and appreciation for the hard work of our staffs. I'd like to thank members of the council for your attention and your partnership on this effort. I know there has been tremendous effort on this report since March. The council works to identify, address, and foster resilience to vulnerabilities in the financial system. And this includes vulnerabilities arising from new and emerging technologies and sectors. In April, I delivered a speech on digital assets at American University, and I argued that the government should promote responsible innovation, innovation that works for all Americans, protects our national security interests in our planet, and contributes to our economic competitiveness and growth. Innovation is also one of the hallmarks of a vibrant financial system and economy. But as we've painfully learned from history, innovation without adequate regulation can result in significant disruptions and harm to the financial system and to individuals. Digital assets have grown significantly in scale and scope over recent years. They've attracted a large amount of capital and interest from both retail and institutional investors. And at the same time, we've seen very significant shocks and volatility within the crypto asset system, particularly over the last year. With the potential for this kind of instability at mind, in mind, at our February meeting, the Council named digital assets as one of its key priorities for the year. The Council's report we're voting on today finds that the current regulatory framework has helped largely insulate traditional financial institutions from crypto asset related financial stability risks. But it states that crypto asset activities could pose risks to US financial stability if their interconnections with the traditional financial system or their overall scale were to grow without adherence to or being paired with appropriate regulation, including enforcement of the existing regulatory structure. The report also identifies a number of material gaps in current regulation and recommendations to address these gaps. Some of the recommendations are focused on actions that council member agencies can take with existing authorities, and others require Congress to provide new authorities. This report adds to analysis of digital asset issues that have been covered in other recent reports, including on the future of money and payments, consumer and investor protection, illicit finance, and a framework for international engagement. And in all these reports, we provide a strong foundation for policymakers as we work to mitigate the risks of digital assets while realizing the potential benefits. The reports also provide a valuable addition to the public's understanding of digital assets. Before we vote, I understand that there are a number of members who would like to offer remarks. Let me ask Chair Powell to start us off. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'd like to join you, Madam Secretary, in thanking everyone who worked hard on producing this very important report on the financial stability implications of digital assets. I support this report and its recommendations. It is important to establish a federal prudential framework to address the risks of digital assets. Acting now will allow us to support responsible innovation while, pre while preserving financial stability. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Secretary Yellen. I'd like to thank the staff of the FSOC for working on to produce today's thoughtful report on financial stability risks associated with the crypto market, and I, too, support it. The first big crypto token, Bitcoin, was proposed 14 years ago this month on a cypherpunk mailing list. It was Halloween night, 2008, in the middle of the financial crisis, and Satoshi Nakamoto wrote about a new way to move value on the internet without a central intermediary. Nakamoto, we still don't know who she, he, or they were, didn't have faith in the financial sector overseen by folks like us sitting around this table. What does the crypto market look like today as a teenager? First, it's highly volatile speculative investment class. Second, this market isn't so decentralized. Now we see the industry populated by large, concentrated intermediaries, which often are an amalgam of other services. And third, the crypto cannot exist outside of our public policy frameworks. That's regardless of what Satoshi Nakamoto might have initially thought or what market participants might say today. The policy frameworks include protecting investors, consumers, yes, guarding illicit activity, and supporting financial stability. Uh, whether you call something a crypto token, a stable coin, or a decentralized platform, these public policy goals remain the same. As Aristotle apparently once said, treat like cases alike. Um, so of nearly 10,000 tokens in the crypto market, I have said publicly, I believe vast majority are securities, some are not. Offers and sales of the crypto tokens are covered by the securities laws if they're securities. And given that most tokens uh, may well be securities, it follows that many of the intermediaries similarly need to follow the laws that are already laid out. And as the FSOC report notes, there's a difference between regulatory arbitrage and non-compliance. All market participants benefit when there's a broad compliance with the rule, and further it increases investor confidence in our market. And frankly, though, the crypto market, there's a lot of non-compliance with the laws. Thus, I've asked staff to work with market participants to help ensure that investors in the crypto market get time-tested protections. In addition, I look forward to working with Congress to achieve the public policy goals as laid out in the report, consistent with maintaining regulation of crypto security tokens and, and, re and related intermediaries at the SEC. And in so doing, I hope that we don't inadvertently undermine securities law, which underlie the $100 trillion capital market. To the extent that crypto intermediaries may need to one day register with both the SEC and the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, I would note we currently have dual registrants in the broker-dealer space and in the fund advisory space between our two market regulators. And furthermore, I believe that should bank regulators receive authority around safety and soundness of stable coins, as we laid out in the President's Working Group report a year ago, Again, I think it's important that market regulators maintain conduct authority over stable coins as sometimes they're inside our intermediaries that we regulate. I look forward to working with colleagues and ensuring for investor protection and resiliency. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Acting Controller Sue. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Um, I'd also like to thank the staff for a very comprehensive and thoughtful report. Uh, I support the report uh, on digital asset financial stability risks and regulation and would like to draw special attention to the recommendations focused on minimizing regulatory arbitrage. We know from the 2008 financial crisis what happens when regulatory agencies fail to coordinate effectively on risks that cut across jurisdictional lines. An unlevel playing field emerges and financial stability risks grow in the shadows. The Council was established by Congress to address that problem. However, for the Council to work as designed, each member must consider financial stability from a system-wide perspective, first and foremost. This is especially important in emerging areas like crypto. With this in mind, I believe it is critical for the Council and for Congress to prioritize Recommendation 4 regarding interagency coordination, Recommendation 5 regarding a federal prudential framework for stablecoin issuers, and Recommendation 6 regarding regulatory visibility and authorities over all of the activities of crypto asset entities. Properly implementing these recommendations will help mitigate regulatory arbitrage and thus risks to financial stability. In the meantime, we at the OCC are committed to ensuring that the nexus between crypto and the federal banking system does not become a channel for cross-contagion, while also supporting responsible innovation and progress. 
I look forward to working with all the stakeholders on addressing the risks and opportunities presented by digital assets while protecting consumers and businesses and ensuring the continued stability of the U.S. financial system. Thank you. Thank you. Acting Chairman Grunberg. Thank you very much, Madam Secretary, and I'll be brief. I'd like to join my colleagues in expressing my support for the report. I really believe it a, provides a valuable overview and analysis of the financial stability risks of digital assets and a thoughtful set of recommendations. It also provides an important overview of the existing regulatory and enforcement authorities and how they might be effectively applied to digital assets. And it highlights the significant existing coordination efforts among the agencies regarding digital assets and how they might be strengthened. So taken together, in my view, this is really a valuable addition uh, to our understanding of this issue and how we might approach it. Finally, I'd also like to acknowledge the FSOC staff for their cooperation with our staff at the FDIC and the staff of the other FSOC agencies in crafting this report and building support for it across all of the FSOC members. I really think it was a very constructive contribution. And finally, Madam Secretary, if I may, I'd like to thank you for your leadership on this issue and indicate that I look forward to working with our colleagues to address the priorities in the report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marty. Um, Chairman Benham. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Uh, first off, echoing my colleagues' comments, I would like to thank um, the Council's staff for producing an excellent report and also lend my support for the report. I think it's a very positive step forward for FSOC. Um, I would like to point out, I agree with many, if not all of the things Chairman Gensler said, I think we have to work together. We have worked together historically and we'll continue to do that. Um, and I think the things that we've been doing very proactively is on the enforcement side, and we will continue to do that um, until these gaps are filled. I think that is something the report clearly identifies is that there are gaps um, in the authority that we have collectively, and I think we are gonna collectively, the SEC and CFTC work together to ensure that we use all of the existing enforcement authority we have until new authority is provided. And I look forward to working with the council and Congress to make sure these gaps are filled as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Commissioner Cooper. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Um, uh, for the record, uh, my name is Charles Cooper. I'm the commissioner of the Texas Department of Banking. I'm going into my fifth year on, on this council, which I'm very proud of. I represent my state, my fellow state banking regulators who charter and supervise 79% of our nation's bank under the dual banking system. And we also license and regulate many service businesses or MSBs. I'd like to join my colleagues first in commending the FSOC staff and the member agencies on a report that helps regulators industry and the public better understand the risk associated with digital assets. This report and its recommendations should inform the work that we do as individual agencies and on a interagency basis to balance responsible innovation with safeguarding our financial markets and consumers. And as is many other points in history, states have been the laboratories of innovation where we've learned about digital assets, the risk involved, and how to best protect our citizens. State bank regulators look forward to sharing what we have learned and working with other agencies and Congress to protect the U.S. financial system while allowing for prudent innovation and recognizing our respective roles in supervision as well as consumer protection. And I would like to stress, Madam Secretary, a very critical principle that appears throughout this document, and that is cooperative federalism. We welcome a digital asset regulatory framework that embodies that importance and centrality of states and federal coordination as well as interagency coordination in developing policy and, and supervising digital asset activity. Now, I believe that this very council exemplifies this principle and reminds us that we must learn from one another 
and we will best succeed when we work together. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other members who would like to uh, speak? I'll speak? just say, uh, Madam Secretary, thank you. I'm really pleased that we're adopting this report today and want to thank everyone who was involved in it. And I just want to comment on the connection to our payment system. You know, a fast and resilient payment system is good for consumers, it's good for businesses, and it's good for all of us. But we need to make sure that we're thinking about stable coins in the context of that payment system. Both the private sector and the public sector are offering new ways to transfer funds, and digital assets is another way that the private sector is thinking through this world. And I think it's important that we highlight as the report does, how stable coins pose opportunities and risks. Stable coins are overwhelmingly used today in speculative crypto asset trading, and they are not yet ready for consumer payments. However, as many of us studied Facebook's Libra proposal a few years ago, stable coins could quickly scale if powered by a major platform or other network with significant market penetration. This would have a lot of implications for the entire system. And as the report notes, the entire crypto ecosystem's leverage, opacity, liquidity transformation, and associated risks could disrupt the broader financial system. So as stablecoin arrangements pose more imminent concerns than other parts of the crypto asset ecosystem, especially as banks, big tech companies, and P2P providers explore launching their own stablecoins, we have to be on alert. Many of our agencies have already taken steps to address discrete issues, such as those related to deposit insurance misrepresentation, or to lay groundwork to address concerns related to fraud, hacks, and scams in our payment system. And of course, we all must use our existing authorities as well as look to it, obtain more. Last November, the President's Working Group on Financial Markets recommended that the FSOC consider using its existing authorities to enhance the regulation of stablecoins absent comprehensive legislation. There are some tools that currently sit on the books. For example, the FSOC could look to Title VIII of the Dodd-Frank Act as one potential way for federal regulators to gain greater visibility into the stablecoin ecosystem and you and uh, find heightened safeguards where appropriate. And I think this report will help us not only coordinate, as Commissioner Cooper said, between federal and state agencies, look to our existing authorities as well, and ultimately safeguard our payment system and financial system. Thank you very much. Would anyone else like to um, offer a comment? Okay, then do I have a motion to approve the resolution approving the digital assets report? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The resolution is approved. Let's turn to our next agenda item. Today, the Council will vote to establish the Climate-Related Financial Risk Advisory Committee. This is FSEC's first external advisory committee. We will also vote on the initial slate of committee members. Climate-Related Financial Risk is complex to evaluate, reflecting the complicated transmission channels linking transition and physical risks to the economy and financial sector. Council member agencies have made great strides in improving our understanding of these risks, but we can benefit from the expertise of individuals affiliated with climate science groups, academia, the financial service industry, nonprofits, and many others. The new advisory committee will be a crucial resource to help the Council gather information and analysis from a broad array of stakeholders and advance our understanding of climate-related financial risks. Our first class of members is incredibly talented, and they will bring diverse and expert perspectives to the Council's climate-related work. The members are from academia, 
non-governmental consumer and environmental organizations, and small and large financial institutions. The committee will help the council receive and analyze climate-related financial risks. I look forward to their significant contributions to support our ongoing work. Addressing climate-related financial risks is an urgent priority and requires our collective efforts from both the public and private sectors. Thank you. Are there any questions? Then is there a motion to approve the resolution approving the charter of the Climate-Related Financial Risk Advisory Committee? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Okay, the resolution is approved. And now, is there a motion to approve the resolution approving the membership of the Climate-Related Financial Risk Advisory Committee? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All, opposed say, aye. all opposed say nay. Okay, thank you. The resolution is approved. Okay, our next agenda item is a presentation on the upcoming Treasury report on cloud services adoption in the financial sector and related cybersecurity implications. I'd like to turn to Todd Conklin, Treasury's Deputy Assistant Secretary for Cybersecurity and Critical Infrastructure Pres Protection for the presentation. Thank you very much, Madam Secretary. I appreciate the opportunity to update the Council on work that Treasury and its partners in the Financial and Banking Information Infrastructure Committee, or FIBIC, are working on with respect to cybersecurity and critical infrastructure. As many Council members are aware, earlier this year, Treasury started working on a report on cloud services and potential implications for operational resilience in coordination with the FIBIC. We hope to publish this report by the end of the year. We are supported in this effort by a group of experts from FIBIC member agencies. This is an important effort for Treasury and FIBIC, not just because of the subject matter, but also as a learning exercise for FIBIC to gather and share information on a proactive basis and generate a common sector-wide operating uh, picture on an emerging issue. The report will focus on public cloud services and the financial sector's use of three major cloud models. First, software as a service, which involves the use of cloud-based applications over the internet on a subscription basis like video conferencing or productivity software. Second, platform as a service, which allows customers to build custom cloud applications without having to manage the underlying servers or application environment. And third, infrastructure as a service, which offers nearly full control of computing, storage, and networking resources on demand. We initially focused on concentration and critical infrastructure. In the last few months, we also considered cloud adoption at small and medium-sized financial institutions like community banks and credit unions. The report will assess how cloud services are currently being used, how they may evolve, and what gaps may exist that could impact the sector's operational resilience. We recognize that third-party services can both introduce new risks when used inappropriately, but also can reduce risks when used appropriately. Ultimately, it is the private sector, not the government, that has responsibility for design, implementation, and risk management of cloud and other third-party services. At the same time, transparency from the government including Treasury and the financial regulators, is crucial to promoting effective resilience in the sector. We hope that the report will help inform the financial sector and promote constructive cooperation among financial institutions and cloud providers. In developing our analysis, we're considering a wide range of input to make sure that the conclusions are data-driven and technically sound. We're relying on four primary sources for this report. First, input from FIBIC members through a stock take on their own experiences and observations in each pocket of the sector. Second, 
from within Treasury, including lessons learned from Treasury's own cloud adoption journey, as well as from interagency and international engagement. Third, relevant literature published since Treasury last examined cloud services in 2018. Fourth, discussions with chief information officers and chief information security officers from both cloud service providers and financial institutions, as well as independent experts and industry trade associations. We've now talked with dozens of organizations as part of this process. The interviews have been very helpful and helped unpack a number of issues for us. One of the questions we've been evaluating is the extent to which the financial sector has started using cloud services. We don't have firm statistics on adoption of cloud services by the financial sector, but information we have received from stakeholders and FIBIC members confirm that the levels of adoption still vary widely across the sector. Since the onset of the COVID pandemic, many software as a service applications have become commonplace, but the use of more complex services like infrastructure as a service to run core processing for regulated financial services is still rare across the industry. While some large financial institutions are pursuing strategies to dramatically reduce their on-premise data center footprints, most are pursuing an iterative hybrid strategy that relies on public, private, and on-premise infrastructure. But we do still see that the large banks and financial market infrastructures are very interested in continuing to explore cloud services, and many of them have developed long-term plans to do so. We expect continued growth in cloud adoption as it becomes more of a mainstream technology. This expectation underscores the importance of gaining an understanding of the benefits and risks of financial institutions' reliance on these services. As I mentioned, we are also looking at issues relating to the use of cloud services by smaller financial institutions. Key issues for these institutions include securing the right balance of transparency from the cloud services uh, provider to its clients on due diligence and incidents, difficulties for smaller firms in negotiating service contracts, and how the overall cybersecurity talent gap leads to challenges in the cloud services context. As we develop our report, and over the longer term as we continue to work on these issues, we will collaborate with the private sector and organizations like Cyber Risk Institute, FIBIC members, and our international partners, many of which are also considering increasing their oversight of cloud service providers. Thank you, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Todd. The COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated the adoption of cloud services by financial institutions. And when figured appropriately, cloud services can benefit operational resilience at the individual firm level. But the interdependency of these networks can magnify cyber risks, threatening the operations, not just of individual institutions, but the financial sector as a whole. And as such, it's critical that we review how these services may affect the sector's operational resilience and develop a common understanding of the potential opportunities and risks of cloud adoption. So let me ask, are there, um, as Todd asked, are there any questions on the presentation? Really? T Todd, I just wanted to thank you for you and your team's work on this. This is obviously something that is growing in importance across every jurisdiction in the world. And it's important that we understand how it's uniquely affecting the financial sector. Every single sector of the economy is obviously making this transition to cloud and how the healthcare sector is dealing with it, how educational institutions are dealing with all, we must understand how it will uniquely affect us. So I, I really appreciate all the work that has been done on this, Todd. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Okay, then our last agenda item is to vote on the minutes of the council's last meeting. Do I have a motion to approve the resolution approving the minutes of the September 23rd, 2022 council meeting? So moved. And a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Aye. The resolution is approved. Okay, before we adjourn, does anyone have any other business to raise?
Seeing none, can I have a motion in a second to adjourn the meeting? No motion. Second. Thank you. The meeting is adjourned.